Hello and welcome to the live read of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Today we'll be reading chapter 12 in the book. So let's begin. Chapter 12, Peter's First Battle. While the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beavers and the children were walking on hour after hour into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago they had left the coats behind them, and by now they had even stopped saying to one another, Oh, look, there's a kingfisher, or, oh, what's that lovely smell, or listen to the thrush. They walked on in silence, drinking it all in, passing through patches of warm sunlight into cool green thickets, and out again into wide mossy glades where tall elms raised the leafy roofs far overhead, and then into dense masses of flowering current and among hawthorn bushes where the seat smell was almost overpowering. They had been just as surprised as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole wood passing in a few hours or so from January to May. They hadn't even known for certain as the witch did that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells which had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began that something had gone wrong and badly wrong with the witch's schemes and after the thaw had been going on for some time, they all realized that the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge. After that, they didn't hurry so much, and they allowed themselves more rests and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what I'd call bitterly tired, only slow and feeling dreamy and quiet inside, as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on one heel. They left the course of the big river come some time ago, for one had to turn a little to the right to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once the thaw began, for with all that melting snow, the river was soon to flood, and their path would have been under water. Now the sun got low, and the light got redder, and the shadows grew longer, and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver, and he began heading um, uphill against some very deep and springy moss, in a place where only tall trees grew very wide apart. The climb, coming at the end of the long day, made them all pant and blow, and just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, suddenly they were at the top. And this is what they saw. They were on a green open space from which you could look down on the forest spreading as far as one could see in every direction, except right ahead. There, far to the east, was something twinkling and moving. By gum, whispered Peter, the sea. In the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great grim slab of gray stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old, and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when they looked at them. The next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on one side of the open place. A wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now, when the light and the setting and the sun fell upon it, with sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and tent pegs of ivory. High above it, on a pole, the banner which bore a red rampart, lion fluttering in the breeze, which was blowing in the faces from the far-off sea. While they were looking at this, they heard a sound of music on their right. Turning in that direction, they saw what they had come to see. Aslan stood in the center of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves round him in the shape of a half-moon. There were tree women and well women who had strung their instruments it was they who had made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like a huge English farm horse, and the man part was stern but beautiful giants. There was a unicorn and a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican and an eagle and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopards, of whom one carried his crown and the other his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who haven't been to Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good or terrible at the same time. If the children ever thought so, they were cured of it now, for when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great royal's overwhelmed eyes, 
And then they found that they couldn't look at him and they went all trembly. Go on, whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. No, sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver back again. Susan, whispered Peter, what about you? Ladies first. No, you're the eldest, whispered Susan. And of course, the longer they went on doing this, the more awkward they felt. But then at last, Peter realized it was up to him. He drew his sword and he raised it to salute and he hastily saying to the others, come on, pull yourselves together. He advanced to the lion and said, we have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam, said Aslan. Welcome, Susan and Lucy, daughters of Eve. Welcome, he beaver and she beaver. His voice was deep and rich and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet and it didn't seem awkward to them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fourth? asked Aslan. He has tried to betray them and joined the white witch, Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. And then something made Peter say, that was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him. I think that helped him to go wrong. And Aslan said nothing, either to excuse Peter or to blame him, but merely stood looking at him with his great unchanging eyes. And it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan. But it may be harder than you think. And then he was silent again for some time. Up to that moment, Lucy had been thinking how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked, but now it suddenly came into her head that he looked sad as well. The next minute, that expression was quite gone. The lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together. Terrible paws, thought Lucy, if he didn't know how to velvet them. And then he said, Meanwhile, let the feast be prepared. Ladies, take these daughters of Eve to the pavilion. Minister to them. When the girls had gone, Aslan laid his paw, and though it was velveted, it was very heavy, on Peter's shoulder and said, Come, son of Adam, I'll show you a far-off sight of the castle, where you are to be king. And Peter, with his sword still drawn in his hand, went with the lion to the eastern edge of the hilltop. There a beautiful sight met their eyes. The sun was setting behind their backs, and that meant that the whole country below them lay in the evening light, forests and hills and valleys, and winding away like a silvery snake the lower part of the great river. Beyond all this, miles away, was the sea. Beyond the sea, the sky, full of clouds which were just turning rose-colored with the reflection of the sunset. But just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact, at the mouth of the great river, there was something on the little hill shining. It was shining because it was a castle. And of course, the sunlight was reflected from all the windows which looked toward Peter and the sunset. But to Peter, it looked like a great star resting on the seashore. That, said Aslan, is Care Paravel of the Four Thrones, in one of which you must sit as king. I show it to you because you are the firstborn and you will be high king over all the rest. Once more, Peter said nothing, for at that moment a strange noise woke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle, but richer. It's your sister's horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice so low as if to be almost a purr. For a moment, Peter didn't understand, but then when he saw all the other creatures start forward and heard Aslan say with a wave of his paw, back, let the prince win his spurs. He did understand and he set off running as hard as he could to the pavilion and there he saw a dreadful sight. The naiads and dryads were scattering in every direction. Lucy was running toward him as fast as her short legs would carry her. Her face was as white as paper. Then he saw Susan make a dash for a tree and swing herself up, followed by a huge gray beast. At first, Peter thought it was a bear, but then he saw that it looked like an altizen that was far too big to be a dog. Then he realized it was a wolf, a wolf standing on its hind legs with its front paws against the tree trunk, snapping and snarling. All the hair on its back stood up on end. Susan had not been able to get higher than the second big branch. One of her legs hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. 
Peter wondered why she didn't get higher, or at least take a better grip, and then he realized that she was just going to faint, that if she fainted, she would fall off. Peter did not feel very brave. Indeed, he felt he was going to be sick, but that made no difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the monster and aimed a slash of his sword at its side. That stroke never reached the wolf. Quick as lightning, it turned around, its eyes flaming, its mouth wide open in a howl of anger. If it hadn't been so angry that it simply had to howl, it would have got him by the throat at once. As it was, though all this happened too quickly for Peter to think at all, he had just time to duck down and plunge his sword as hard as he could between the brute's foreleg and into its heart. Then came a horrible, confused moment, like something in a nightmare. He was tugging and pulling, and the wolf seemed neither alive nor dead. Its bared teeth knocked against his forehead, and everything was blood and heat and hair. A moment later, he found that the monster lay dead. He had drawn his sword out of it and was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat off his face and out of his eyes. He felt tired all over. After a bit, Susan came down the tree. She and P Peter felt pretty shaky when they met, and I won't say that there wasn't kissing and crying on both sides, but in Narnia, no one thinks any of the worse of you for that. Quick, quick, shouted the voice of Aslan. Centaurs, eagles, another wolf in the thicket, there, behind you. Just darted away after him, all of you. He'll be going to his mistress. Now is your chance to find the witch and rescue the fourth son of Adam. Instantly, with a thunder of hoofs and beating of wings, a dozen or so of the swiftest creatures disappeared into the gathering darkness. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true. Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade and saw it all smeared with the wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it quite clean on the grass, then wiped it dry on his coat. Hand it to me and kneel, son of Adam, said Aslan. And when Peter had done so, he struck him with the flat of his blade and said, Rise up, Sir Peter Wolfsbane, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. Well, that is the end of chapter 12, so that's where we'll leave it for today. Come back tomorrow for chapter 13 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. Till then, I hope you're all staying happy, healthy, and safe. I'll see you next time.